Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session looking at the recent official amendments to the NEC4 suite of contracts. So in terms of just a little bit of housekeeping, I'm going to be keeping an eye on the questions and answers as I go along. But just in case the IT does not play ball, I will deal with any questions that we don't get round to at the end of the session. And if I'm unable to do that, you'll also have my email address and you can get to me directly via that mechanism. So, just by way of a brief introduction before we get started, um, hello everyone, my name is William, I'm a director at Fort Green and Brown, originally qualified as a civil engineer and now I practice as a solicitor, so very much a technical person that, that does the law. In terms of what we do as a business, we review contracts, we draft them on behalf of clients um, and then ultimately see those, those issues through to adjudication and I'm also qualified and practicing as an adjudicator at the moment, so I'll be able to maybe lean on some of that experience this afternoon, especially whenever we look Look at some of the recent amendments that have been made to option W2 of the NEC, which deals with that very topic of adjudication. As I say, that's the, all you're going to get by way of a sales pitch. Um, as I said, I'll give you my email address again at the end. So if there are, are any questions or queries you have on any of the content that we're about to cover, that's probably the best way to do it. So, in terms of what we're going to get through over the next 45 to 60 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at the January 2023 amendments, which have obviously recently been published by the NEC. Again, they're, they're called the January 2023 amendments, but they actually only came out maybe two weeks ago at the end of February. Um, but nonetheless, we have new amendments to the suite, and that's the core of what we're looking at here this afternoon, to make sure everybody has an understanding as to what you can do moving forward with the NEC suite. I briefly, towards the end of the session, will cover the October 2020 amendments and also the January 2019 amendments. Again, those amendments at this point are you know, relatively long in the tooth, um, relatively speaking. So I'll get through that quite quickly and maybe just point you in the direction of some further resources that you might want to call upon if you want to know more detail about those. The final two things that I will consider today are X29. So it is a that's what it says on the tin. It's a brand new X clause, a secondary option X clause published by the NEC drafters that deals with a very topical issue, and that is the issue of climate change. I'm going to talk through you know, what exactly that clause look like, looks like and how it works, but one of the takeaways there is that we're going to have to see how it's implemented by the market over the next couple of years or so to really understand whether or not that clause actually works in practice. But I'll explain a little bit more about that when we get there. The final clause there is another secondary option, secondary option Y, and as you can see, it's YNI, standing for Northern Ireland, and I actually drafted that clause on behalf of the NEC, and it was published there maybe the middle of last week, so this is by far and away the most fresh amendment that we're looking at. It does what it says on the tin, it brings the contract in line with the laws that we have in Northern Ireland, so if you are practising in Northern Ireland, if you're drafting contracts, to make your life enough a little bit easier, you probably want to be putting that one in just to align the laws of the contract or the procedures in the contract with the laws of Northern Ireland. If you're working anywhere else in the UK, it already does that, and it does that via option Y, funnily enough, UK, Y UK2 specifically. But we need to have a Northern Irish version of that's the takeaway. So we'll get straight in then to looking at these January 2023 amendments and we'll see what exactly is under the hood. So the, the way to split this up, um, again, this is my way of splitting it up, there's no right or wrong way of doing this. I've considered it by looking, first of all, at the amendments to the long form contracts. So the likes of your engineering and construction contract and you know the Blue Peter in me, there's an example of that. The common contracts that most people are, are used to dealing with day and daily. And that includes the long form of the NEC subcontract as well, which has a purple cover. The other category, again, the other key category, is the amendments that have been made to the short contracts, which again are different contracts entirely. You have to treat them as very different beasts because the risk profile and how those contracts operate is different to the likes of your ECC, your engineering and construction contract, the long form. A couple of really key um, amendments have been made to those contracts, which are really useful additions, in my opinion, and that's the ability for a contractor to cap its liability for design at a reasonable skill and care standard, and also the ability for them to cap their exposure based on a set financial limit. So our total liability to you, the client, under, under this contract is the original total of the contract, the original total of the prices, for example, and I'll touch on that in a bit more detail. <clears throat> 
As I say, these are the two main areas that I'm going to focus on for the purposes of today. But just to be absolutely clear, there are a few more amendments made to some of the more niche forms of the NEC contract. For example, the FM contract, and specifically the short form of that facilities management contract, and also the short supply contract, which deals with goods effectively when you're purchasing goods. I'm not going to touch on these in any real detail because, as I say, they're quite niche, whereas I think for the purposes of you know tailoring this to the average person in the industry, they're going to be interested in the long contracts and the short, which is why we're looking at each of those in detail. So the first amendment that I want to look at here is, is absolutely a key one, and this is how does a contractor recover their defined cost whenever the labour resource in question is not working within the working area, is not working within the site typically. So the first thing I want to explain here is what exactly the working areas are under the standard contract and ultimately where we use that when valuing compensation events and getting the contractor paid under some of the other options. So the way this works and the inroads to understanding this is having a good understanding of what defined cost is. So defined cost is effectively what the contractor is entitled to recover. Under an option A and an option B, defined cost is only used for compensation events. So if a compensation event arises, the contractor is entitled to claim. How do they mount their claim? They go and they look at the short schedule of cost components, which sets out all of the different things that you're entitled to. The point is, item number one of that schedule, short schedule of cost components is your people. And under the standard NEC contract, again, this one that I have here printed in 2017, the old version, unamended, only allows you to recover your people costs if and when they spend time within the working areas. So if your working areas is defined as the site, you can only recover the, the cost of your site agent or your commercial staff if they're on the site. If they're working from home one day a week, strictly speaking, that is not recoverable, which is ultimately what this amendment seeks to do. It seeks to enable a contractor to recover the cost of its people, even if they're not working within the working areas. I'll caveat that shortly and I'll look at it in more detail. The other inroads to this, the other you know, preliminary point to understand is defined cost is used slightly differently under option C, D, E and F because you don't only use it to work out the value of compensation events in those options, you also use it to value all of the contractor's payments. So under these main options, this amendment is even more significant because all of the contractor's payments work on a defined cost basis. They all work on the basis that you have to work out what people are recoverable. And up until this point, they could only be recovered if they were working within the working areas. But now that position has changed. You can now recover their costs if they're working outside of those working areas. So broadly speaking, that's what this amendment seeks to do. And I just want to show you exactly how it does that. So what I presented on the slide here is just a little extract from the schedule of cost components. This is from the short schedule. Again, if you're using option C, D, E and F, you'll use the full schedule. But this is the short schedule of cost components from an option A or an option B. So as you can see here, this is the original. This is the vanilla wording. And the key part that's been changed is this element at the bottom. So you can see here, you can recover all of your site staff, which would fall into that bullet point your you know, commercial manager who comes to the site one day per week or whatever it happens to be under that bullet point. But the point is you can only recover their costs using the people rates based on the time they spend within the working areas. So if your site manager isn't on site today, you can't recover their costs in theory. And again, that's what the vanilla contract says. That particular part of the um, schedule of cost components has now been replaced with this, where instead of only being able to recover their costs if they're on the site or within the working areas, you can recover their costs regardless of that, based on the total time that they spend working on the contract. So if they're working from home one day a week, you know, doing their compensation event quotations or whatever it happens to be, you know, preparing a design, you can recover that cost. You no longer have to be within the working areas. I would caveat that by saying, however, you still have to read the rest of this clause. So, you know, that doesn't apply to everyone within the contractor's workforce. This only applies to the likes of people whose normal place of work 
is within the working areas. So for example, if you've got a site engineer who is working a rotational shift pattern of six weeks on site and one week from home or one week from the head office, before this change, you'd only be able to recover the first six weeks of that. Again, this individual falls into this category. Their normal place of work is within the working areas, but based on this arrangement, they get one week at home or you know, back and back at base effectively. And under the new version of this clause, you are able to recover the full seven weeks. It's very much a case of the NEC drafters bringing it in line with the way people normally work um, post COVID anyway. Another example, again, commercial manager. Again, this one's slightly different. This one is based on the likes of an option C contract where you might have part of your head office, which is actually part of the of the working areas. Quite a lot of contractors do that because they recognize that quite a lot of work will be done off of the site. And in this scenario, you might have a commercial manager working three days a week in the head office and two days a week at home. Again, strictly speaking, whether or not it was enforced is a different story, but strictly speaking, you could only recover three days of that time as defined cost. But based on this very simple amendment, you can now recover all of that cost. Um, that's the first amendment and hopefully everyone appreciates the significance of that. Um, as I said, it's of certainly of more significance under a CD, E and F contract because you use this defined cost mechanism, this schedule of cost components for all of the contractor's payments. So very significant indeed. Just going to look very quickly to see if there are any questions on this. Um, there's a question there um, from Dimitros. Can we prove how can we prove time spent on a contract working from home, etc.? You just have to do that in the normal way, you know, with your timesheets or whatever evidence you, you happen to have to hand to do that. Um, but again, that's an evidential point that it will ultimately be up to the contractor to prove that. The next amendment is, compared to the last one, not that significant at all, really, in my opinion. The first thing I'll note is it only applies to design and build contracts. And by that, I mean contracts where the contractor under the scope is required to do some sort of design or if they're required to provide design as part of their tender submission as um, contractor scope. Again, that's what we mean by DMB here. There is no off-the-shelf NEC DMB contract. So if you do have a contractor with some sort of design responsibility, then this is a very minor amendment that we've made to clause 22.1. As you can see here, it's so subtle that most people would probably miss it. Under the original NEC, Strictly speaking, the client was only allowed to use and copy the contractor's design. This is, a, is an intellectual property clause. It basically allows them to use that design if they want. That was slightly too narrow um, in terms of an interpretation point. And now the drafters have allowed it to also copy any documents prepared for the design, which makes total sense. You know, if you were to really, really narrowly interpret this point, you know, Technically speaking, the client isn't allowed to use the BIM model. They're not allowed to use any of the drawings, etc. But here, they've broadened the scope of this, of this ability of the client to use and copy both the design and also any documents prepared for the design, all of your drawings, your schedules, and so on. As I say, it is a, it's a, a required amendment. It does ultimately open up that to a bit of more common sense, but it's subtle nonetheless, and just one just to be aware of. Adjudication then under option W2. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I do work as an adjudicator, I practice as an adjudicator, and this one is more important for the likes of us. It's not necessarily too much of a problem for the parties. So just so you know, the way this works under the original contract is what I've illustrated on the screen here. That strictly speaking, all of the submissions, so you know, once you've got the referral notice issued by the party bringing the dispute, the adjudicator had to corral all of the other submissions within 14 days. So if they wanted a response, which they normally would, that had to be served along with any reply, perhaps any rejoinders, all of the party submissions in that two week period, which is too short. You know, that that never happens. And take it from me as an adjudicator, I've never seen that happen. You know, parties getting everything done in that two weeks. So practically speaking, it never happened anyway. The parties would normally agree to extend those timeframes in conjunction with the adjudicator, and the contract allowed the parties to do that. But what the NEC has now done is do away with that 14-day requirement, and they simply allow the adjudicator to decide the procedure and the timetable. 
which brings it into line with normal and um, established practice and also brings it into line um, with the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and how it would work under the scheme as well. So, you know, as an adjudicator at the outset of a process, my process anyway, is to wait until I receive the referral notice. And then once I receive the referral notice, I will give a direction to set the timetable for the remainder of the process. Depending on the length of the referral notice, I would typically give the responding party something like, you know, seven to 14 days. Again, seven days if it's an exceptionally small issue, 14 days if it's a bigger one. Always being mindful that you've got a job to do in this 28 day window. Then I would normally say something like if a, if a reply is required, which I will direct, then it has to be served within you know, maybe three to, to seven days, again, depending on the size of the documents. And thereafter, any further submissions are only at my request. That's the sort of standard directions I would be issuing. And this new amendment under the NEC simply allows adjudicators to do that without having to you know, shoehorn it effectively or square peg the round hole that was the original language. So, as I say, not one really for the for the day-to-day -day users of the NEC, but if you do find yourself in a dispute, this will be helpful because it just makes everything a little bit easier and builds in that flexibility that is often required. The next one is quite a significant change. Um, you really do need to approach this one as if it's a brand new clause. That's the advice that I will be giving most people. So, what they've done is delete entirely the original version of X22 and also X22 has previously been amended under the October um, and January amendments which were which came previous to this one so you know there's quite a lot of X22s rolling about in the ether there so the advice that I give people is be absolutely clear which one that you're going to be working to and treat this new one as an entirely new process it is much better it builds in things that were in my opinion clearly missing from the original X22 and um, so it is useful to treat it as a new process so maybe just as a very broad introduction to what this clause is first of all it's a two-stage contracting clause early contractor involvement is what the NEC calls it where basically the contractor is is appointed at the outset to take the works through or perhaps even the services through to stage one and thereafter, once they've done all of that work, it's up to the PM to decide whether or not they give the notice to proceed to stage two, which would then go on and ultimately build the thing. Stage one might be the likes of taking it up to RIBA stage three, stage four, and then stage two would be RIBA, RIBA stage five and beyond, actually getting the thing built. So it's very much at its core a two-stage contracting clause designed to bring in the contractor at an earlier point so that they can help the client you know, value engineer the job effectively because contractors have all of that institutional knowledge how to get these things built cheaply and efficiently. Again, I don't want to use the word cheaply in a pejorative um, sense, but ultimately that's what um, they're designed to do here, to bring the cost down as far as possible. Just going to check if there are any further questions on this one. Seems to be a good lot of questions coming through here, through here more on the working area points. So we'll come back to that just at the end. So in terms of the key things that have been changed here, as I say, a number of subtle differences have been made throughout. So it does warrant reading the thing from afresh. But in terms of, of my summary of the key changes, they have added in further flexibility within stage one, which is a key thing. And one of the things that they have um, enabled the parties to do, which wasn't there before, was to change the site information. So the contractor will be given you know, a set of site information documents at the tender stage, again, all the way back um, before the contractor's involved. Then whenever they're going through stage one and preparing the design, say for example in that period and rightly so they carry out some further ground investigation they go and they get some more boreholes carried out they get a geologist in they get an interpretive report whatever that happens to be and they're now able to incorporate that into the documents for stage two moving forward you know if the works do proceed to that build stage they can update the site information and it effectively redraws the line in the sand and it's that new site information that the contractor is deemed to have allowed for when it comes to pricing the ground conditions so if you are wanting to take some notes there the site information links directly to clause 
which basically sets out all of the things the contractors deem to have allowed for, site information, things referred to within it, visual inspection, etc. And also into 60.3 which sets out what happens if there are ambiguities or discrepancies within that document. And then lastly, all of these things point towards clause 60.112, which is the physical conditions clause under NEC, whereby if this um, site information describes the site as being lovely and, you know, lovely and soft or hard, depending on what way um, it works for the contractor, and they get to the site and it turns out to be the opposite, this clause would allow them to claim for effectively adverse physical conditions. So that's a very good one and a very good amendment to X22 in my mind. There is then greater clarity, um, which has been added to the process, which is followed if stage two does not proceed. So again, the project manager has the ability to green light or red light the process at the end of stage one, and whether or not they want to proceed to stage two is up to them effectively within the rules of the contract. Prior to that, it wasn't quite clear what exactly happened at that point, and they've added in this clarity to improve the process. And it basically sets out that all of the stage two work is removed from the scope. In other words, there's no further work for the contractor to do moving forward. And the completion date, which again normally is, is based on when stage two will complete, um, is deemed to be the completion of stage one. In other words, we take all of the future work off of you and we adjust the date all the way to the left-hand side of the program to end the project or end this early contractor involvement or the contract as a whole at the end of stage one, which again, is what people were doing in practice. They were, again, trying to square peg around hole slightly. So by having that additional wording in there, it can only help everyone in my opinion. The second part, again, also sets out what happens if the works do proceed to stage two. So in the same way, this is just adding in a little bit more clarity as to what exactly happens in that scenario. Um, one of the key amendments that have been made is the fact that compensation events, which are to be judged against the contract date, and there only are a couple of those, which are X2. I'll explain what I mean by this shortly, X12 and X19. So those compensation events, and again, pretty much only those compensation events, are all judged based on the shoes the contractor had on at the contract date. So the contract date is the date that the contract comes into formation, effectively. It's a defined term within the contract. You go and you'll find it there. It's the date, it's the date that the contract came into existence, whenever the, the, the contractor's tender is accepted, basically. And that point in time is effectively a line in the sand and up to that point in time, say, for example, if you have option X2, X2, the contractor is deemed to have allowed for all changes in law up to the contract date. However, if you have option X2, any changes in the law after that contract date are the client's risk. And if they arise, it will be a compensation event. And the same thing here for X12. This is all to do with ground conditions. It sets out when the contractors deem to have priced the ground conditions. And as we saw previously, because we now have the ability to update the site information, they needed to update that. Same thing with um, number 19. It's the prevention compensation event or force majeure, if you want to think of it that way. Again, what sort of events is the contractor deemed to have priced? Well, under the standard wording, they're deemed to have allowed for everything up to the contract date. And then they have to ask themselves, what would a reasonable contractor take into account after that date? And if it's reasonable to take into account after the contract date, they're deemed to have allowed for it. So again, it places that risk with the contractor up to a point. What this is now doing is it said, instead of saying you have to take on board everything that was happening at the contract date, they recognize that you know, you've been on board with each other for a period of time, preparing the stage one element of the works. Again, that could be the preliminary design or whatever it happens to be. And you're about to enter into stage two. We should draw a new line in the sand at that point. And again, that's the new line, as I say. The date that the PM gives the notice to proceed to stage two is the date that the contractor is deemed to have taken on board all of the changes in the law. And after that date, that's when the contractor will be entitled under the likes of X2 to a compensation event. So that's another very positive change in my mind. It just updates it to reflect reality of the situation effectively. And then lastly, another important one is the confirmation that any compensation events that occurred before stage two. So again, we've got our little timeline here. This is the original contract date. This is doing all of your stage one work. You've then got this notice to proceed to stage two, and that takes you into the stage two works. 
quick compensation events can arise in this period. You know, you could ask the contractor to value engineer another building on the site or value engineer a foundation solution that they were never asked to do, and that would be a compensation event. The point is, whenever this, this notice to proceed is given, you want to have a clean break between um, phase one and phase two, or stage one and stage two. So what the wording now says is that any compensation events that happened in this period, and the likes of these two, your foundation design, whatever it happens to be, your value engineering, um, is deemed to be included within the stage two prices. So this is going to need, practically speaking, a bit of cooperation between the party and um, between the parties, and specifically from the contractor. Whenever they are forecasting or preparing their costs for stage two, they need to make sure it takes into account any outstanding compensation events that arose in stage one, just to make sure that it's all been wrapped up because they're deemed to be included within the prices for stage two, which is given towards the end of stage one. So, as I say, as you can see there, this is quite a complicated clause of the contract. It's probably one of the most complicated parts of the NEC, um, and you do need to make sure that you're well advised on how to use it. My advice, um, my initial advice anyway, is to treat this brand new amendment as a brand new process and make sure that you're reviewing it from start to finish in isolation. Don't try to compare it to the old one, just put the old one in the bin and use the new one if that's the route that you choose to go down, which I think you should. And then moving on to the short contracts, so again everything that we've been talking about up to this point has been looking at the long form contracts and we're now moving on to the short form. Again, here's um, the ECC short form used for works that are you know, deemed to be of I don't want to say lower value because value should never dictate what contract you use, but jobs that are less complicated or less complex. So there's two main things have been added into this clause, and in my opinion, you know, finally is what I've described it here, and they're long overdue. The first one is a limitation of the contractor's liability for design to only using reasonable skill and care. This wording that's been added in, um, and again, it is optional wording, you don't have to use it, I'll explain that shortly, is very similar to X15 under the main form of NEC contract, again, this one with the black cover. If you have option X15 in your main contract, it does the same thing. It limits your responsibility for design to doing what a normal, reasonable consultant would do. I say it's optional because within the contract data, um, you have to option it in within this short contract. So if you go to your contract data part one, um, or data provided by the client, is what it's called under the short contract, you'll see this little optional provision where it asks you a, a question, is the contractor required to do design effectively, yes or no? And if you're putting yes into that category, you're able to bring in this wording. So clients in the audience, you do need to make sure that you're incorporating this if you want to. And um, Contractors in the audience, you should always be asking for it because capping your liability at reasonable skill and care is within your best interests because that's um, all your PI insurance is going to cover you for. So you need to make sure you get that in there. Um, which again, as I say, that's the point of this language to cap that exposure to reasonable skill and care. What this clause also does, and again, within the wording of, of 83.4 and within the contract data, it also requires the contractor to take out and hold and maintain professional indemnity insurance, which, again, if you're having a contractor doing design, that's something you're going to ask for as standard. The problem with this contract is that it doesn't have it in there. And quite a lot of short contracts, in my experience, do have some sort of design element. Even though they're straightforward works, there might be parts of it foundations, whatever, that are being designed by the contractor. So if that is the case, you want to be using this clause as the ultimate takeaway to make sure the contractor is you know, capping their liability and also to make sure that you can ask for the PI insurance as a client organisation. The next clause is of a similar vein to the last one. And again, I've said also, finally, it's also well overdue in my opinion. So it adds new wording or adds a new clause, 84.1 which effectively caps the contractor's liability um, in total under the contract. So if you've got a contract you know, for a million quid and you know, it's potentially a little bit of risk there, you would potentially want to be capping your liability as a, as a contractor to say, if in the event that the building falls down, the most that you can ever recover off of me is, let's say, a million quid, the original value of the contract, or 
the amounts that can be recoverable under our, our insurances, and you can cap your liability in that way. Same thing as adding in a limitation or a cap on liability for delay damages. You could say something like, um, I appreciate that if I go into delay, I'll have to pay delay damages, but I want to cap it at a certain amount. That's another type of, of limitation. And this clause enables you to do that you know, using standard language instead of having to negotiate it in as a Z clause. So some of the things that you can cap your liability for under the standard wording, the liability for loss of or damage to the client's property. So again, building falls down and then you know falls into another office block, damaging it. You can cap your liability for that. Again, you would probably want to be capping that you know with reference to your all risk insurance, etc. Your total liability to the client, and again, that does what it says on the tin. That would be the likes of delay damages any liability for defects, etc. Again, you can cap that at a set financial amount. You might even want to start from a negotiating perspective to say something like only 10% um, of the contract sum, and that's our upper limit. And then lastly, you can also cap your liability for indirect and consequential loss, which links into the previous one, where you're just able to set a financial limit. This contract, this is the worst that could ever happen. It's not going to it allows you to know that it's not going to sink your business. That's the key thing that you'd be looking for with respect to a limitation of liability is that protection. Whenever I'm advising clients under the um, short contract, specifically contractors, and I'm you know reviewing their Z clauses and pointing out where all the risks are, um, I'm always adding in or suggesting from a negotiation point of view that we add in a limitation of liability. So the fact that the NEC has now put this in as standard, in my opinion, is only going to make those um, negotiations much easier because at least we have standard NEC language to do what I'm asking for. The final point I'll make about this, again, this wording or this notion of having a limit of liability under NEC is not new. It's the exact same thing that we have under X18 of the long form of NEC contract. For some reason, the short forms, you know, just took the language out and they didn't try to replace it with anything else. And they're now seeing the error of their ways there and adding it back in. So it's a good amendment, in my opinion. So that concludes the very quick review of the January 2019, sorry, 2023 NEC amendments. We also, however, as I said at the start, have two other sets of amendments that were published in January 2019 and also October 2020. The 2019 ones are um, not significant, I would say. The most important one in my mind is the change that they made to clause 63.5. 63.5 which deals with the assessment of delay to a compensation event. And they have went in and tweaked the language there, you know, how it works with reference to the dividing date. And it also links into one of the NEC practice notes, which if you don't know, and they do exist. If you go onto the NEC website, you'll find practice notes for different elements of how to manage an NEC contract. And one of them is dealing with delay. What happens if you've you know, got to accept a program that's well out of date and lots of compensation events have happened since then? How do you approach that very common problem? Well, there's an NEC practice note out there to help you to deal with it. And it links in to that, to that amendment under 63.5. The remaining ones are, are rather straightforward. You just have the ability to replace your senior representative. So if a director moves on from the company, there is no way to replace them under the standard NEC. We now have a way to do that. So very minor. And the same with PI insurance. And um, the contractor has to provide the certificates on an ongoing basis. Again, people were doing that anyway, typically speaking, but they've amended the contract to make it a requirement. These two amendments then under October 2020, they're slightly different in nature. They were driven by some um, happenings in the case law that happened after the NEC was published. This first one was all to do with a case called Triple Point. Triple Point Technology. Um, all to do with what happens whenever you terminate a contract and how that impacts upon the client's ability to recover delay damages. All they've done with that amendment, in short, is and it is very short is go into option x7 to say the ability to levy delay damages ends at um, completion of the works which is standard or um, the defects sorry the termination certificate being issued which is the new part it just makes it slightly clearer what happens if you have to terminate a contractor whenever they're already in delay mm -hmm. 
This last one only applies to the NEC service contracts, and it came from another piece of case law. The name escapes me, unfortunately, um, it was a number of years ago. But basically, it says that you cannot pin the final date for payment of an invoice or whatever it happens to be um, on the date that a VAT invoice or an invoice has been served. So the final date for payment is when the contractor has to be paid. And the mechanism under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act can't allow it to be fixed to this movable object of when uh, of when a notice is served or an invoice is served. It has to be fixed to, fixed to something rigid. It has to be an adequate mechanism. And the court decided that if you're if you're linking it to VAT invoices and invoices in that way, it's probably not compliant. It was an obiter statement in the case, but um, it was a statement from the from the courts nonetheless. It was significant enough, I suppose, for the NEC drafters to perk up and listen. And because some of the service contracts contracts were drafted in that way. The case law was a bespoke subcontract, it had nothing to do with NEC, but you know they, they were similar in how they were worded, and the NEC drafters decided to get ahead of it and change it. So if you're working under the likes of the professional services contract, term service contract, you would want to make sure that you're incorporating that amendment, just to make sure that the payment terms are fully compliant with the law. So the next one and our penultimate clause that we're going to be looking at here is X29. As I say, this one um, was recently published by the NEC for very good and laudable reasons to put climate change at the forefront of everyone's mind, which again is absolutely key for everyone. What it does is effectively set out a new defined term, which is called the climate change requirements and it doesn't really go into any detail on what that is but the NEC has also published a guidance note to go along with this so it's useful in that respect and it sets out that the climate change requirements could be the likes of you know a certain level of recycled material being used on the site recycled aggregate etc etc the use of um, renewable energy on the site, you know, a certain amount of electric vehicles, it could be a set level of carbon, etc. Lots of different things to think about. The point is that these targets effectively, these requirements are set by the client whenever they're going out to tender. So, dear market, on this project, this HS2 project, which I see today might, you know, might be putting the brakes on a certain element of that. So whenever that's going back out to tender, you know, we need a certain level of electric vehicles on the site, or you have to use, you know, a certain type of fuel. And this is the quota that you have to hit. And you have to set that out in the scope. And ultimately, if you don't meet these client change requirements, because they are part of the scope, not complying with it by definition would be a defect and that ultimately takes you into the management process of a defect under clause 4. Ultimately what this boils down to then um, and another really important part of X29 is what they have coined as the performance table and what this effectively is is a set of KPIs so they'll set out and there's a little template for the performance table within the guidance note you know, you need to use a certain number of electric vehicles on the project. And if you can use more than that, we, we will pay you this incentive sum, you know, X amount of thousand pounds per vehicle or whatever it happens to be. But by the same token, you can also put in low performance damages into that. So if you don't use a certain amount of electric vehicles, you can negatively incentivize it. In other words, on one hand, you've got the carrot, the KPI. On the other hand, you've got the stick, the low performance damages. In my opinion, I don't necessarily think having X29 is required. I personally think all of this can be achieved under the standard NEC. So the likes of the client change requirements, that could just be stated in the scope. You don't have to call it anything specific. You could just have a section of your scope called the client change requirements, and then all of this would be the same thing. And this performance table, so under the NEC, you've got option X17 which is low performance damages and option X20, which is KPIs. So you could do all of that as well. You know, you have them all built into the contract. The only thing that X29 has also done is improve that process. So they've actually gone and built upon X17 and X20 to make it slightly easier to implement. You know, what happens if a compensation event happens that changes the performance table? All of that is now dealt with under X20 whereas before it wasn't dealt with under X17 or X20 respectively. So there's slight improvements there, um, but ultimately it doesn't take away from the fact that under the NEC, we now have a clause called climate change. 
which regardless of my you know not concerns but observations about you know the fact that it could all have been done anyway under the NEC setting those aside I really do think having a clause called chat called climate change is a positive step in the right direction because it will focus everyone's minds towards it and if that's the aim of the NEC then I think it's a laudable aim at that so well done them for, for you know, getting ahead of the curve on that and then finally and the last amendment that's been published recently is YNI so this little part here believe it or not as part of the UK and um, it is what it is and ultimately if you're using the NEC within Northern Ireland it doesn't currently work if you're working in the mainland UK so you know England Wales or Scotland draw that line wherever you want Hadrian's Wall all of those jurisdictions are subject to a piece of law called the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act the point is that Housing Grants Act doesn't apply in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland has its own devolved version of that called the Construction Contracts Northern Ireland Order. And it's very similar, um, but there, it's not exactly the same. There are subtle differences between the two. And the point is, if you try to use the NEC in Northern Ireland, what people were typically doing was using YUK2, which complies with the Housing Grants Act, not this one. And they were option up, they were using option W2 to resolve disputes, which again complies with this one, not this one. So what YNI does is bring both of these clauses in line with the law of Northern Ireland, the construction contracts, as I say, Northern Ireland Order of 1997. It's not a massive change, it just makes the makes the contract compliant if you're using it um, in NI. And then finally, a practical point just to conclude today's session before I start looking at um, some questions. And I see Jeremy has mentioned the case there. It was Rochford um, and Kilham was that linking the final date for payment to an invoice point. So thanks for pointing that out. So as I say, the final practical point just before we move on is how to get all this incorporated. You know, I do sense there being a bit of a danger at the moment because I'm guilty of it. I will pick up my NEC contract and I will read it based on what is printed out in front of me. But potentially there are other clauses floating around in the ether and you do need to be careful that you're actually reading the correct clause. So if I was just to pick that book up and start reading X22, but for some reason, you know, they've amended that and they've changed it, I'm actually reading an out of date version. So just be careful with that. But that aside, if you do want to get these amendments incorporated, there's lots of different ways you can do it. But in my opinion, the easiest way is to do something like this. So whenever you're drafting your contract data or using the NEC template, whatever you happen to be doing, you can simply add on to the back of it where you're describing the contractual setup that you're amending the NEC contract as of the January 2019, 2020 and 2023 amendments. What, what that's called is um, incorporation. You're incorporating something by reference and it's perfectly legitimate to do that. And you can go and download all of these clauses on the NEC website as well. Same thing if you want to use X29, again, you can refer to it there. And if you're working in Northern Ireland, you're advised to bring in option YNI as well, which will, as I said before, update this clause and this one to make the contract work in Northern Ireland. So that's us, absolutely bang on time, um, 45 minutes. What I'm gonna do now is just start to take some questions, but just before I do, um, I'm gonna send everyone a short feedback link. I'd appreciate it um, if you'd complete that, it helps us keep these things um, as, as good as possible. I will also be sending a copy of the slides, and if I don't send them, they will be sent by the um, CICES directly. So watch out for an email from Heather on that regard. The final thing, um, we run an NEC, a 12 week NEC course and um, there's 24 week course 12 weeks is all about contract law and the other 12 weeks is all about NEC so if you're interested in getting signed up to that to become an NEC accredited contracts manager it's an official course run and um, which we run on behalf of the ICE who publish the NEC then feel free to get in, uh, get in touch and there's my email address again so what I'll do I'm just going to start taking some questions and I'm also putting into the chat box a link to that feedback. So hopefully you can all see that as well. So question-wise, where do we even start? 
So there's the question there from Steve Wood, which I think is is a good one. Do you see any problems naming head offices or depots as part of the working area? And um, yes, absolutely. That would be open to abuse, I think, is, is the concern there. So in my experience, what most contractors will ask for in the first instance is the whole head office. But whenever they're negotiating that point with the client, it might be a certain part of the head office, which which, you know, crystallizes a certain area and avoids it being open for abuse in that regard. The other point that I would say, Steve, in that one is that you also have to look at the preamble to the schedule of cost components that, that would cover you anyway there, that sets out you can only recover something, and the second bullet point says, if it is incurred in order to provide the works. So it's not as if you can put everybody onto the roster and claim everybody. They still have to be doing work on the contract. Um, so I think that, to an extent, would, would resolve that problem. Uh, question there about materials. Yep, they'll be sent on after this presentation. On the working areas point, if there are individuals working from home. Sorry, Darren, I can't see the second half of that question. Question there from Derek Ross, do the amendments apply automatically from the date of publication? No, is the short answer to that. So we touched on that a couple of slides back. If you do want to be incorporating these amendments, you do need to make sure that you're referring to them within your contract. And the same thing applies to any contract. It is what you write it down as on the page. And if you're simply saying the June 2017 edition, it doesn't mention the amendments, so you have to, to incorporate them by a reference. Derek is the answer to that one. Do they, and a linked question that you have to that, do they have retrospective effect? No, for the same answer, Derek. Um, they don't have any effect unless you incorporate them into the contract. Uh, Darren Medhurst has a question on the working areas point. If the individuals are working from home five days a week, 100% of the time, would they need to be either included in the fee or redefine the working areas? I think so, is the short answer to that, because if they're working from home, and I'm just going to jump all the way back to this one, Darren. If they're working from home all of the time, then they're not going to fall into the definition of defined cost because to fall into the definition, their normal place of working has to be within the working areas. So if they're working from home full time and their home, their their you know office at their house is not part of the working areas, then they'll not be captured. So you're right, they probably would have to be incorporated and captured as part of the fee. Next one, D -d 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 Jeremy Dixon, X2, stage one CEs need to be implemented prior to the PM's notice to proceed to stage two. Um, so if the parties can't agree on the compensation events, they would normally draw up a schedule of that. And then ultimately, um, it's up to the contractor to price that accordingly, um, Jeremy. So based on the new wording of X22, any compensation events that haven't been implemented, any compensation events that haven't been assessed, are all deemed to be within the contractor's price for stage two, is the answer to that one. A couple more people, yep, slides will be shared. There's Jeremy mentioning Rochford again, thanks for that. How does one keep track on staff working from home and how does the client feel comfortable with that? Again, that's up to the client to audit the account effectively. All of the the main options that use defined costs, typically speaking, are options C, D, E, and F. You would only use it for compensation events under A and B. And under all of those options, C, D, E, and F, it works on an open book basis. So the client is free to, to audit that at any time. And again, it's up to, to, to the contractor to put forward a convincing account as to why all of these people are needed in terms of the list of individuals and ultimately why the durations that they're claiming are recoverable and why that time was required to provide the works. That's never going to be a black and white answer, um, but ultimately it's up to the parties to work together to, to determine how much time was actually required. Uh, Tom Murray, are the NEC guidance and practice notes free? So there's two different things there. The NEC guidance notes, they're over there in my library, they're not free, they're about about 70 quid per book. They're actually very good. I'd recommend getting yourself a copy if you've, if you've used them then daily. The practice notes are free. They are on the NEC website. So if you go onto the NEC and, and have a bit of a look there, you'll find, I think there's maybe six different guidance notes on different parts of, um, of actually administering a contract and they are free. Um, our course is fully online and remote. We've got ourselves a very good application and e-learning platform that we use. Um, everything's delivered by Zoom and all the recordings are uploaded so you can do them in your own time as well.
but the exam is administered um, and proctored by the NEC directly. So you know you, you do have to do the exam under exam conditions. It's not multiple choice. Uh, next one again, linking back to working areas, which is interesting because there's quite a lot of questions on this. You know, from my perspective, so it's clearly the ones that people are interested in. What if people are based in the main office but work from home three to five days per week in accordance with the flexible working policy, in Victoria? So yeah, we covered pretty much that exact scenario on one of these slides. So this one. This is where you have your commercial manager who again is based in head office, let's say it's an option C or option E contract. Um, and due to the company's flexible working policy, they're now working from home two days. This clause enables you to claim that, assuming, however, that the, the, the head office in this case is actually part of the working areas, which would be quite a common thing to see under the likes of an option C, D, E or F contract, Victoria. So I think the answer is, is yes to, to your question there. And I think that is pretty much all of the questions. As I say, if I missed any folks, feel free to drop me a line. But if there are no more, I will let you all get back to your very busy day jobs. And thank you all very much for coming along.